Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Pretty Little Alibis. We're so excited that you guys are here to hop on the true crime train with us. Uh, can you believe that we're finally doing this, Alex? Angie, I cannot believe this. We have been talking about this journey for what seems like forever, and now this finally means no more secret meetings. Oh my gosh, the secret meetings. <laughs> it's been so difficult trying to hide it from everybody, but uh, here we are. And this is our very first episode, and we hope that everyone enjoys it. Um, as a fellow humans, we are probably going to have some first episode jitters, but you're going to love us anyway, so you'll get over it, right? Today, we're going to be discussing the heinous crime of Yana Kassian. Yana was born in Ukraine. She studied law and worked as a prosecutor at the Ukrainian Tax Service. In 2014, she immigrated to the United States to become a model in California. Not only was she a daughter, but she was a new mother before she was selfishly and brutally killed by her partner, Blake Leibel. Now, after researching for the biography on Yana, I found that there wasn't much on the internet regarding her personal life or upbringing. This was kind of disheartening, as I'm sure there's way more to her life than just being a daughter and a new mother with a job. Um, so her partner, Blake, on the other hand, let's, let's talk about a spoiled uh, trust fund boy. Blake Leibel was a Canadian comic book writer, movie screenwriter, and an animation director. Some of his work includes, uh, he was the director of a comedy film, Bald, Spaceballs, the animated series, and Syndrome, a graphic novel. He was born on May 8, 1981 in Toronto, Canada. His parents, Lorne and Eleanor Leibel, both come from wealth. His father, Lorne, made a fortune as one of Canada's largest home developers and sailed on Canada's 1976 Olympic team. His mother, Eleanor, was also born into wealth. Her father developed a plastics company that does poly tarp. So it's basically the tarp that protects your beds and furniture when you're moving, like the big tarps. Uh, Blake's brother, Cody Leibel, was only a year older than him. They both moved to California in like mid 2000s with some friends, and they were all trying to make it in Hollywood. Cody was known for his collection of Ferraris, high-stakes gambling in L.A. and running his own record label, C-Note Records. Cody was allegedly a part of the same underground gambling ring as Ben Affleck and Leonardo DiCaprio. Though neither of us have ever seen it, there is a movie based on this ring, which is titled Molly's Game. Blake and Cody were both born into luxury. They were what you consider trust fund kids. Cody was a party guy. He would provide Blake bottle service at the clubs and even introduce him to many women. Cody actually introduced Blake to his first wife. Her name was Amanda Braun, and she was also a model. Their mother, Eleanor, passed away of brain cancer in 2011. She left Blake her Forest Hill home in Toronto, her art collection, a beautiful L.A. mansion he lived in at the time with his then wife and child and various other assets. The rest, including company shares worth $7 million, were to be split evenly between Blake and Cody. So they come from some wealth, huh? Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm not trying to, to judge anyone here just yet. Um, you know, we haven't gotten in, into any specifics. Yeah. But um, just really setting up where they came from and a little bit of, like, Their who background. they are. There's more research on their personal lives. Blake went to live with his mother. Cody was living with his father when they separated. And um, I, I, from my understanding, Eleanor and Lauren never divorced. They were just separated for 30 years. And it could be because of financial reasons. Um, you know, obviously, when people divorce, there's a lot of, like, background that goes into it and money and... Maybe it was easier for them to just stay separated. Um, I never understood why. I couldn't figure out why they never were divorced, but they, I know that they were separated. And hmm. so when um, Eleanor passed away, you know, Blake felt alone because he had almost no relationship with his dad. It seems like his dad, Lorne, had more in common with Cody than he did with Blake because Cody kind of lived like, you know, like the Ferrari fast life. And that's what his father was into. And Blake was more, uh, I don't want to say introvert, because I don't know that for a fact. But 
I mean, he was into comics and, you know, that's kind of a different world. So the relationship with his dad was just different than it was with his mother. Now, in terms of relationships, it was very clear that Blake's successes in Hollywood brought him attention from very attractive women because honestly, um, he wasn't, let's say, Chris Hemsworth, for example. So, <laughs> so Blake and Amanda met in 2006. Together, they had a son. They were together for a couple years, and again, she fell pregnant with their second child. Blake moved out, filed for a divorce from Amanda when she was only eight and a half months pregnant with her second child. Now, after leaving Amanda, Blake immediately entered a new relationship with Yana. But not only did he enter this relationship, he was also seeing another woman at the same time. This was his coworker, Constance. But within months, Yana too became pregnant. A friend of his said, quote, we all thought he stopped talking to us because he was embarrassed of what happened with his wife. Yana's mother, Olga Cassian, said their family was so excited when they got the news Yana was pregnant. And when Yana had their daughter, Blake seemed very happy in the beginning. Friends of Blake said he had extreme anxiety. He was afraid that the Russian mob his brother lost money to over poker would seek vengeance on him and his family. And remember, his brother Cody was in a gambling and was even allegedly a part of a gambling club. Now, according to Blake's friends, the real reason for his anxiety was due to his chaotic personal and romantic life. Blake was in a love triangle. While going through his divorce with Amanda, living with Yana, he was dating his mistress, Constance. He put this anxiety all on himself. Friends that were close to Blake said that during this time, he became obsessed with themes of violence and brutality. So this guy, he got himself into a pickle, uh, juggling that many women. But why even put that on yourself, right? First of all, these women are beautiful. I want to know what <laughs> their conversations were like when they met. You know, like what, what about this guy kept these women interested? They're all beautiful women, and he's just Blake, so. I mean, I don't think any any of their conversations were authentic, because, I mean, think about all of the lying you'd have to do. And oh my God, yeah. We haven't even gotten into that piece of it just yet, because as we know, I've gotten in, we've gotten into this. We know he was not very truthful. And even just knowing that he was with Constance... I mean, that right there, like, you know, he started lying somewhere. So no, no part of him was authentic already. Yeah, I mean, I feel bad, too, because honestly, Amanda was with him since they met in 2006. So they were together for a solid 10 years, almost, when he started. I mean, I, I, I don't know if he was cheating on her throughout his relationship with her, but for this to, you know, finally come out and there to be multiple women that know about each other. It's just so unfortunate. And I feel really bad for her, too. I mean, not only was Yana going through it, but, you know, these women were being strung around. Also, allegedly, OK, he had left the mansion in Beverly Hills to Amanda. He got a condo with Yana in West Hollywood and allegedly paid for Constance to have her own condo down the street from their condo in West Hollywood. Wait, Can I tell you that. Okay. That I didn't know. Yes. Now, so the, when I say allegedly, this is from the research that I've done. Clearly, there's been a lot of things on the Internet that we cannot clarify. But if that is the case, he's he's even more disgusting than we already know he is. So Constance, like, so Constance had was it a condo or a house paid by Blake? It was, Constance had a condo or an apartment. I should say one of the, one or the other. It wasn't a house. The only one that had the mansion was Amanda, his previous wife. Oh, okay. so she stayed in the, the nice big mansion in Beverly Hills that was paid off. And then he when he left her, he left it to her and he went and got a condo with Yana in West Hollywood. 
And then down the street from that condo, he was apparently paying for wherever Constance was living in like um, a condo or an apartment. Same difference. Oh, okay. So Amanda had the house or mansion. Um, Mm -hmm. Constance had a condo and he was living with Yana in a condo. Yes. Okay. Makes sense so far. I'm following. (laughs) Okay. So um, let's just recap on the timeline here. So Blake and Yana met in 2015, just a year before she was killed. Soon thereafter, they became pregnant. And on uh, May 3rd of 2016, Yana gave birth to their daughter, Diana. And that was just weeks before she was murdered. Um, On May 20th, 2016, Constance Bukafuri, I think that's how you say her last name, she reported Blake for sexual assault and he ends up in jail. He was only held for 15 hours before posting a $100,000 bail. He somehow got Yana to bail him out, although at this point, Yana had every intention of leaving him because she found out what it was for. Uh, While he was in jail, she had packed up her things, moved out of their apartment to live with her mother. Uh, The charges convinced her it was time to leave. Uh, According to Olga, Blake had been extremely controlling prior to him being in jail. Yana was still recovering from a C-section and Blake would threaten her that he would leave if she didn't have sex with him. He would even ask Yana if he could leave her to be with other women. Yana was so committed to fixing their issues that she sent her newborn baby to live with her mother so she can focus on hers and Blake's relationship. Uh, Olga's mom came from Ukraine when she found out that Yana was having this baby to help take care of the baby. So the baby was basically a majority of the time with her mom after she gave birth. Um, However, shortly after his release on May 23rd, 2016, he contacts Yana and convinces her that he couldn't live without her. She was out shopping with her mom for strollers. And after he made contact, she looked at Olga and said, I'm going to him, mom. Like, I have to go. While still on the phone, she walks out of the store. And that was the last time that her mom would ever see her daughter alive. And so now before we go into saying things like, oh, my God, why would you leave? Why would you go and see him? Let's not forget that Yana was a new mom and she was also probably hormonal. Uh, People do crazy things when they're in love with somebody. And um, it's just very unfortunate that she felt like, you know, she was very committed to fixing her relationship. And this is how it ended. Right. Like, what do you think about it? I completely agree. Because in terms of him contacting her, that phone call that she left when she was with her mom, Olga, she was on that phone call for a total of seven minutes. So I'm very curious as to what he said to her in those seven minutes that made her rush out and leave to be by him. And just like just like Angie said, she's probably hormonal. And I mean, maybe she moved out, but, you know, you still care about people you're with. So like i can't blame anybody for trying to work things out absolutely and you know now that things have happened you know their their lives are under or we're under a microscope so we could say you know why didn't she leave him sooner but you know once mm-hmm. she found out about constance that was it for her but again i'm very curious as to what he said on the phone that that made her rush out but i guess that's one answer we're not gonna have yeah um It's clear that he is a storyteller. Not only is he a storyteller in his books, he's a storyteller when it comes to the lies that he's telling these women, right? Mm -hmm. Like they are all just eating it up. And um, it's not anything that I'm, I'm not victim blaming at all because I feel like it's something that like I I do it. Like, uh, you know, you, you feel for somebody that you love and you want to help them and you want to be with them. And especially cause you just had a baby with this man. You want your family to be together. So in her mind, she's probably thinking like, I, you know, I want to fix this. I want this to work out. And she went to be with him. But again, like we, it, like you said, we don't know what he said to her. Um, now, do I think it's messed up that he was threatening her or asking her if she, he could leave to go have sex with other women? Like, while she's recovering from a C-section, having your child 
Yeah, that's that's messed up. If you're a guy and you're listening to this, don't ever, don't you ever swear. <laughs> I that's and reading that, that is like something that hit me too. Like if my if my husband felt that way, like I feel like one of the things I'd say is like, okay, if you're gonna do that, then I'm not gonna be here. Like it's weeks, only a few weeks after giving birth. And to have the audacity to ask that question, and I don't know what he was expecting. Like, was was he expecting her to cave and actually have sex with him? Or did he hope that she was going to leave him so that he could go play around? Yeah. I think it was just, like, also a manipulation tactic of him trying to break her down and make her feel worthless, you know? Like, it's... She's already probably because you, you've heard it like I don't have kids. I don't know what it's like, but I I also do know people that have had children that feel different after they have kids. And, you know, she was a model. Her body was different, you know, like she's coping with changes like physical things about herself. And so she's probably not feeling her greatest. Not only that, but yeah, she did have a C-section. She's not thinking about having sex with you, <laughs> you know, like it, it just relax. And he's just totally making it all about himself. It's such a selfish conversation to have when you should be enjoying like these first beginning weeks with your newborn baby and your girlfriend, fiance, whatever she may be to you at the time. But um, it's really unfortunate that she went through that. And it makes me super sad that. Not only like was she not only was she killed a few weeks after she had her baby, but she didn't even get to spend those few weeks with her daughter. Like, really, if you think about it, like she was busy bailing his ass out of jail, trying to fix her relationship with him to have a better relationship for her daughter, you know, and then she gets her life taken away from her. So it's like she didn't even get to enjoy being a mother for the short amount of time that she was a mom after she had her baby. That makes me so sad. It's it's heartbreaking. On May 24th, 2016, the very next day, Olga didn't hear from her daughter. Uh, she repeatedly called and texted Yana's phone before showing up at her apartment. Olga knows in her gut that something is terribly wrong here. She called the police department and they aren't taking her seriously. They just think that Yana had a baby and maybe she's resting, but Olga knows something isn't right. Olga decided to go to the apartment herself. She can't seem to get into the gate, but she sees the windows open to their apartment. So she starts yelling for Yana from the sidewalk just below their balcony. Blake comes to the window, makes eye contact with Olga and closes the window. Like, N doesn't say anything, just looks at her and closes the window. This is when Olga immediately calls the police again because she knew in her heart that her daughter was in danger. So we're going to play a clip of the 911 call where Olga frantically was trying to get into the apartment. Oh, what's the mother's name on the line? Olga Kasyevna. Uh, my, my name is Olga Kasyan. I want uh, to uh, get my daughter out of that apartment. Safely. I want to open the doors to break into that apartment and get my daughter out. It's been three weeks uh, since she had a C-section and she needs to, uh, she needs doctor's attention. Okay, this is what I'll do. Tell her I will send deputies to do a welfare check to see if she is there. If she's there, we'll talk to her and ask her several questions and tell her that her mother's concerned and um, because she, we haven't, or she hasn't heard from her in several days. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, she won't open the door. They already tried to do that, and they tried to open, they tried to knock, but he doesn't open. He won't open the door. Okay, we'll do another welfare check, and we will call her to let her know the outcome, and then we'll go from there as far as possibly doing a missing persons report. Yes, ma'am. When are you going to go there? Because your life is in danger. We're going as soon as we hang up. So after Olga makes the phone call and practically begs them to do a welfare check, the police department comes and knocks on the door and nobody answers. 
Olga's telling them that she saw Blake, but authorities don't seem to think there's anything going on here other than maybe a frantic mom just overreacting. I wonder if the police are kind of like, she just had a baby. She's probably sleeping, trying to avoid her mom kind of deal. Um, so they leave. Court records show that on May 25th and 26th, Yana failed to respond to 75 texts, 44 notifications, 100 calls, 37 texts, and 16 chats sent to her cell phone. 20 of those missed calls were from Olga. Okay, 100 calls. 100. Um, mm -hmm. one, thing, one thing I really, really caught on to here is the welfare check. So once I heard Olga asked for a welfare check and they didn't try to get eyes on Yana, I came to question what goes into a welfare check exactly. Like what are the guidelines and so forth. But it seems to be very police department specific. From what I found on the police departments in California, they're supposed to set up their own guidelines and policies. However, welfare checks do not require warrants or anything of the sort, but a concerned family member or friend. That's all that's necessary. I understand some people may take advantage of these welfare checks, but I feel no one should be treated in that manner. Like, I think all welfare checks should be handled seriously and quickly. There's no written rule that you must wait 24 hours until someone can be checked in on. It's as soon as a family member or friend have some sort of evidence that something's wrong. So my understanding was they called Yana's phone and left a voicemail and that was really it. So it wasn't until the next day they actually went to the door. Um, unless Olga mentioned that in the phone call that they've already tried to be there once and knocked on the door and left. Is that what you got from that too? Yeah, I I got that she um she got them to knock on the door and nobody answered and so they just left, which is odd to me, especially because Olga was telling them like she just saw him in the apartment. Um you know, she it's not like she maybe she left and came back, but she saw him in the apartment. She told them about it. They came knocked on the door. Now, I read that there was you know, a language barrier situation going on. Um, I, I, but from what I just heard, she spoke perfectly fine English. Like her English was perfect. I understood exactly what she said. So um, if that was the situation, I don't know, but I agree with you. Welfare checks need to be taken way more serious than they are because I mean, 24 hours, a lot can happen in 24 hours. So you're telling me if somebody is suffering, and no one knows about it, even someone that's like alone in their house, because a lot of welfare checks are for what people that are, you know, older, live alone, a neighbor that's like, hey, I haven't seen um, the old guy, Bob next door, <laughs> you know, doing his daily routine. I want to make a welfare check like you're telling me that you have to wait an entire day for someone to come and knock on the door and see if they're going to open the door like it, it. It just boggles my mind the leniency of something as simple as a welfare check. Because it, it, when we get into the crime scene, the welfare check will make a lot more sense as to why timing is like a huge thing. When you mentioned the language barrier, um, I do want to touch on that for a minute. Because when I was looking into the case as well, one of the things that I kept hearing and seeing is that there was that language barrier. So... Mm -hmm. I left that call until right now. This was the first time I've ever heard it. And the thing is, I agree with you. I don't think there was a language barrier. I heard everything just fine. So, yeah, I don't know where that came up or if that was an excuse on anybody's part. But I don't think there was any sort of reason a miscommunication should have been there. I thought yeah. she was very clear. And I agree. Yeah, I that's just my opinion. I think that was that was very clear and I'm I was confused after listening to that where that came from that there was a language barrier. And listen, honestly, if there is a language barrier, where like what happens for the people that are not able to speak English? Olga, luckily, she she spoke English just fine for me, like in, in my opinion. I agree with you. But there's other people that don't speak English. Right. That live in our country 
And uh, what resources do they have then to contact somebody for a welfare check? And are they going to be just dismissed? And I'm not saying every police department is like this. Like, I, I'm not here to attack the, the police department. I'm just speaking in general. Anyone in any kind of customer service role, <laughs> you know, there needs to be some form of accessible communication like translators and things like that that someone can use to better understand you know the the issue at hand because not only are people calling uh for welfare checks they're they're already frantic about something and you know when you're frantic or you're you're worried like it's hard to get your words out sometimes so i don't know i i just i really hope that the, I, I really wish that these things would just be, you know, like a, a simple guideline. Like, I, I feel like this is uh, the, the police department should be the one the one place that you can call for help and to be told that you have to wait 24 hours. It's just it, it's crazy to me. So it wasn't until May 26th, 2016. So almost two days until anyone had heard anything from Yana that the police finally decided that it was time to break into the apartment. They obtain a key from the landlord, go to the apartment, and unlock the door after multiple knocks and no answers. They enter the apartment, and it's in disarray. There's a hallway door that was locked from the inside with one of those latch locks, like the ones that they have in the hotel rooms. Like, you can't lock them from outside. Uh, they end up removing the door from the hinges, and behind the door, they see blood leading into the master bedroom. Now, because the store was latched from the inside, they know someone has to be in the apartment. They continue shouting out for Blake, and he finally responds saying, leave my house. I'm not coming out. And Yana isn't here. Now, obviously, the cops weren't going to leave. Blake goes on to tell authorities that his father is on his way. Now, Blake referred to Stephen Green as his father, but Stephen was actually his accountant and his mentor. Stephen ends up coming to the apartment, is finally able to convince Blake to leave the master bedroom. And when he comes out, police immediately enter the room. And this is when they find her lifeless body laying in the bed of their room. Detective Martindale says that Blake was extremely callous to the situation at hand and that Blake was confident that he didn't kill Yana and goes on to say, well, I guess you'll find out who did it then. Now, in the affidavit, I read that Blake tried to tell the officers that Yana was fine when they need, they said they needed to see her, um, but he said that she was located in the Cedars Sinai Hospital, and he also gave them what was a what was supposed to be like a bed or a room number. Um, but what came to mind was if she was quote unquote fine, why did he give them a hospital? Um, if she was in a hospital, why wasn't Olga notified? Why wasn't he with her? Um, I can understand he maybe have been trying to steer them away but to try to send them to a hospital i feel would be a little alarming and also i mean by the time they got there they'd realize she's not there exactly like what was his plan hey i'm gonna send the police officers to the hospital where she's not at um where apparently she's alone like, yeah, I swear if I was in the hospital and my husband didn't go with me for like some medical reasons, like a serious medical reason, that's that's not OK with me. So I'm sure I mean, police officers didn't fall for it. Clearly, they they do what was up. But um, his mind is obviously not right. If he thought that they were going to just buy that one, they're like, hey, OK, thanks for the info. We're out of here after seeing all the blood in your hallway. Yeah, you know. I guess she's all right. Made no sense to me, but I mean, not much of no. this really does. So, <laughs> no, you definitely brought up a good point, though, because um, him trying to steer him trying to steer them away is just like you could have answered the door and said that. You know, like yeah. he went through all the effort of hiding in the apartment <laughs> for them to come and find you in your bloody master bedroom or, you know, in your apartment for you to tell them that. Like if you would have simply answered the door, you would have 
at least had more of a chance of being like, you know, selling your story. Not saying that he should have, but it's just obviously there's some fishy shit going on. Sorry, but. Exactly. I, I, I just don't think his mind was right in that moment. Like, the only thing I can think of is he was trying to steer them to leaving that complex. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can think of. And again, <laughs> the other piece that I can't understand is why he'd say hospital. Why not just leave it at she's not home? Like, why be that specific? Yeah. And, you know because he was recently arrested for the, the sexual assault on Constance, he could have easily said something like, I don't know. She left me. I don't know where she is. You know, like true. he could have uh, said that she, she did leave. She I don't know where me. she went. She did leave him too. Yeah. So it's like you, I, I hate sounding like we're trying to come up with like, you know, a pretty little alibi for him. <laughs> Get it. But we're not. It's just, it, it just goes to show that he literally has just, he doesn't know what he's thinking. His mind is not right. There are so many different things that could have happened and that he could have said to steer them away from him, but he didn't. Um, and clearly after, you know, it, he's just not in his right headspace at all. I completely agree. So before we get into the, the murder scene, we're going to share some details from the coroner's report and case records just to give you guys a uh, forewarning here. This, these details here are extremely graphic. Dr. James Ribe of the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office described Yana's wounds in extreme detail. Quote, her entire scalp was traumatically absent and was not found, was not present with the body. Her skull had been stripped down to the surface of the bone there was no scalp present except for little bits in the back of the neck. Also, portions of the right side of her face were torn away, including the right ear and part of the posterior face on the right side all the way down the jawline. He also states that Yana's face had bruises, abrasions, and even had a bite mark on her left jawline. Dr. Ribe also confirms that she, quote, lived for at least eight hours approximately after receiving her scalp injury and the bruise to her collarbone. I've never seen this before, and I doubt hardly any forensic pathologist in this country or abroad have even seen this outside of perhaps wartime. It's extremely rare. In September of 2017, Yana's autopsy report was released. The autopsy reported that the model died from severe blunt force trauma to her skull. Her cause of death was exsanguination, which is draining of the blood and blunt force head trauma. Court case records also reflect signs of Yana fighting back. Sergeant Robert Martindale from the Sheriff's Homicide Bureau testified that he met with and photographed a defendant at the Sheriff's Station during the evening of May 26th of 2016 after the defendant was arrested. Blake appeared to be clean and recently washed or bathed. Um, he measured 6'3 with a weight of 210 pounds. Um, Sergeant Martindale observed that Blake had severe bruising to both his eyes, extending across the bridge of his nose. This is consistent with him wearing glasses while suffering some sort of blunt force trauma to his face. He also had some linear scratches under his left eye, long linear red scratches on his chest, and a diagonal linear scratch along the left side of his face. Blake also had scratches on his neck with punctures that were consistent with having been caused by fingernails and an elliptical injury on his right bicep consistent with a human bite mark. The bite mark appeared to have been made as he came around behind the victim so that his right bicep was against her mouth. Okay, so um, one thing that we wanted to do was describe the difference um, between what Blake looked like prior to this crime that he committed. Um, he looks like a normal guy. You know, there's pictures of him doing interviews at Comic-Con. He has pictures of, uh, and these are obviously only photos that I found online, but uh, a picture of him and his ex-wife, Amanda. And, um, you know, he looks kind of quirky, just simple, uh, 
like if I saw him in a store, I wouldn't be threatened by this guy at all. It's just your average Joe, you know. After he committed the crime, he was arrested. They took a mugshot of him. His mugshot is a completely different person. Now, if you are curious, you could look it up online. When I say that if I saw him in a store and I wouldn't find him threatening at all, I could not say that about his mugshot. His mugshot is scary. This man is crazy. His eyes are wide. They are black. Um, he's smiling in his mugshot. So that alone shows how scary this man is. Um, he looks like a lunatic, long story short. And uh, again, if you're curious, you could look it up online. But it, it's definitely something to to reference because if you're interested in this case, seeing his before and after will definitely just explain it, the the insanity behind this man. While it's clear that Yana didn't make it out alive, we do find comfort in knowing that she absolutely tried to fight for her life. One of the disturbing things about this is Blake actually ordered food twice from Yana's phone, the night of the 25th and then the 26th. Here's a statement from the affidavit. Quote, the party stipulated that in 2016, defendant used Kassian's cell phone when ordering food. On May 25th, at 1.48 a.m., defendant used Kassian's cell phone to order food using Postmates delivery service with instructions to leave the food at the door after being buzzed in and to not ring the bell. A few seconds later, defendant texted, quote, after you buzz up. At 2.11 a.m., defendant texted the delivery person, repeating his request to leave the food at the door and not ring the doorbell. Surveillance video shows the delivery was at 2.14 a.m. Defendant ordered food from Cassian's phone again on May 26th, shortly before 3 a.m. And surveillance video shows the delivery 20 minutes later. Now, what do you think about that? Imagine ordering food after you kill your girlfriend. Brutally. She's been tortured. She has been drained of her blood. Um, she's in your house. Like, how are you even able to eat? Like, I don't understand it at all. That's what's confusing. Like, there is blood all over this apartment. Like, wh where could you possibly sit and eat a meal surrounded by blood? I want to know also uh, why he told them not to ring the doorbell. Like maybe for the neighbors, because I think the neighbors would be and that's very late in the night. So I'm wondering maybe not to disturb any neighbors so they don't get attention drawn. I suppose you think that you manhandling your girlfriend around the apartment, you know, would I don't know, I, I guess. You know, it it sounds kind of crazy, but like in my head, when I read that, I was wondering if he told the person not to ring the doorbell because maybe Yana was still alive and she would like scream or something. Um, I don't know. I again, I have no idea. But like earlier when I was saying about all those missed notifications on her phone and all the unanswered text messages and all of that nature, like. He had her phone. And why are you ordering food from her phone and not your own? That's I don't a, know. His, his story makes no sense to me. I, I agree with you. She was alive for eight hours, at least after w what seems like the worst happened to her. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I mean, biting his arm, scratching, punching. Like, it sounds like every ounce of her fought for her life. Yeah, and you said that he's 6'3", he was 210 pounds. Mind you, Yana is 5'4", she weighs 150 pounds. So this woman was, you know, trying her best to get out of this situation. And it just breaks my heart to even envision this happening. You know, what I want to understand, though, is she lived in an apartment. They lived in a condo, and I, it... From the, the pictures of the condo, it looks fairly older, like the building doesn't look too new. Uh, but, you know, we all know that everything in Hollywood is expensive. It doesn't matter when it was built. So I, I just it. It blows my mind that no one heard anything. I know I and I don't understand. I don't actually know how many 
apartments there are in the complex, but they were on, I think, one of the top floors. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were on the second floor. I think it's a three three story building. Oh, and I think they're in the middle. Oh, okay. So even then, you have people above you, below you, and I'm assuming on some side of you, maybe or maybe not. I mean, then you still have maybe above or below. But I mean, let me think. I don't even know what time. Do we do we have like the the time exactly like throughout the day that this was? Because I think they were saying it was. You know, very late in the the night that this was happening. Yeah, it, it was in the middle of the night. Apparently, the the neighbors below said that they heard two thumps in the middle of the night and Blake pacing around the apartment all night and water running. So, we I don't know if the thumps were in the bathroom or in the bedrooms. Um, they just said that it was kind of you know out of the ordinary, like they'd never heard it heard them be like this loud before um but you know it, when i think about them fighting like i know myself <laughs> and i for me personally i'm a loud person so i don't know if like she tried to scream if you know like i really want to understand this but we're not going to so when you mentioned about her screaming now i'm wondering if he was behind her, putting his arm around her and around her mouth, I'm wondering if that was try to conceal her screaming. But I don't recall reading anywhere that her mouth was covered with anything so that she couldn't be yeah. screaming. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. Like, I feel like, and I know we're going to go into it a little bit more, um, but, you know, with what happened to her and being alive through it, I mean, I don't know if there's just a point where you don't feel pain anymore, but I feel like, you know, the normal or natural thing I should say is to be screaming out in pain. Did she reach a point where she just couldn't scream anymore? Or also in the devil's advocate view, I mean, how many of us think that our neighbors fighting could end up like this situation? Um, I'm sure many of us don't think like that. So maybe some people are like, you know, it's not my business. I'm going to keep my nose out of it because you're not seeing blood. You're not hearing maybe, you know, the actions happening. Um, you're just hearing loud noises. Um, so I'm trying to see that part when it comes to the, the neighbor's point of view. But, you know, looking at it now, who knows? Yeah, because, I mean, from my understanding, they only heard a few thumps, right? Like uh, some pretty loud thumps in the middle of the night, and there were only two. And now when I'm, like, reading this court record saying that, you know, there's bite marks and he has scratches and blunt force trauma to his face, like, I just couldn't imagine her doing that quietly. So after uh, talking about the coroner's report, and now I feel like we could go back into the crime scene. Um, after looking deeper into this case, I was able to find the case records describing exactly how Yana's body was found. Yana's naked body was lying on a clean sheet and was covered by a red Mickey Mouse blanket over a blue polka dotted blanket. Her head was on a pillow. Her scalp had been removed. There was another pillow to her left with an indentation on it. There were dried blood stains on the mattress beneath the clean sheet. Bloodstains and human flesh were found behind the bed and bloodstains were on the wall near Yana's head had been. A portion of an eyebrow was found on the floor near the bed and there were bloodstains on the mattress of a second bed, a side table, and in other parts of the bedroom. When the deputies entered, warm water was running in the bathtub of the master bathroom, which was turned off. Bloodstains and hair could be seen in the tub and the drain later tested positive for blood. The drain of the sink also tested positive for blood. Chemical testing confirmed the presence of blood that someone had tried to clean in areas of the dining room, hallway, guest bathroom, and both bedrooms. The kitchen garbage disposal also tested positive for blood. Her head was on a pillow. Authorities report that Yana's body had been cleaned prior to their arrival. 
So detectives use luminol. That's what forensic investigators use to detect trace amounts of blood at crime scenes. It basically glows. Uh, the blood will glow if a crime scene has been cleaned up. So once the luminol was applied to the scene, detectives uncovered blood all over that apartment. It was up and down the hallway from the bathroom to the master bedroom. Blake had cleaned the bathroom and their bedroom after this gruesome act. And I put photos here, Alex, for us to look at. Now, after the blood was uncovered from the luminol, you have to wonder where the cleaning products and the rags used to clean the scene went, right? Well, down the hall from the apartment, there was a garbage chute down to the basement. And this is where authorities uncover 11 blood-filled trash bags. As described in the court records, evidence was found in the dumpster under the trash chute located in the hallway, about 20 feet from the defendant's unit. In trash bags, investigators found blood-stained bedding, towels, clothing, bath mats, placemats, a bed skirt with bloody handprints, human tissue, including some pieces with hair that appeared to be scalp, and an ear. DNA testing revealed Yana's DNA on items including some of the tissue, the ear, and the bed skirt. To put this into perspective for you, um... We have two side-by-sides here. One is the bathroom before the luminol is applied. And it looks relatively clean. I can see a little bit of blood, but it doesn't really look like it's everywhere. Um, at first glance, you could almost... No, yeah. It just, you know, it looks relatively clean. Now, on the other hand, um, on the luminol photo, it, it sort of looks like if you were to turn the lights off in the bathroom open up a glow stick and pour it all over the room. It is everywhere. The bathtub, toilet, the floor. It's, there's very clear evidence that there was blood covering this room. Yeah, there's definitely no hiding it in the bathroom. So like Alex said, the bathroom photo, the side-by-side -side picture, I mean, the bathroom, it, it looks just like an old bathroom. It doesn't look anything like, you know, a luxury bathroom, but it's, it's an old apartment. And just from a glance, like you wouldn't think that something happened in there um, as far as this kind of crime scene. Um, but yeah, with that luminol, like I, it's insane. Like you can't hide anything. Mm -mm. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before, honestly, when it comes to uh, luminol. But I, yeah, this is nuts. You no. guys can also look up the pictures too. If you're interested, just look up Yana Cassian uh, crime scene photos on Google. And I'm sure this exact picture that we're describing, you'll see it. It'll pop up and it's very graphic and um self-explanatory it's kind of just it, it's crazy but uh, let's go on to the other picture here now to describe this one this one's a, quite a bit worse um now on the photo of before luminol there's clear evidence of blood um on this photo we have a mattress on the left hand side the carpeted floor on the right-hand side, and then what looks like the master bed on the right-hand side. And there's what seems to be blood on the mattress on the left-hand side, which is kind of at an angle, but it's very clearly right in the middle. But you can also clearly see that there's a blood spot on the carpet as well. And again, that's before luminol. So on the luminol photo here, it's the entire carpet is highlighted which means that entire carpet was once covered in blood we know yana died of exsanguination which again means that the blood was drained from her body and from seeing this this photo of the carpet in luminol it you can you can clearly see that that this may have been one of the spots that that happened oh this was definitely a spot that this happened. I mean, there's no hiding it. Mm -mm. Um, it. Apparently, the mattress on the left was the mattress that he used to barricade the door when he was hiding in the room. Oh, my goodness. Um, I think that mattress is the one that came from the guest, bath the guest bedroom. <clears throat> so 
that explains why there's two separate mattresses in there because he had removed one from the master bedroom or from the I'm sorry. That explains why there's two mattresses is because he removed the one from the guest bedroom, barricaded the master bedroom door with it. Um, but there's also blood on that one, too. And uh, these pictures. It. Again, uh, it just takes me to back to the whole, you know, why did they leave? He had time. To clean everything like the, these pictures are it, it just shows how much blood was actually there prior to him cleaning and so it's it's really upsetting to see that because this poor woman was just going through it Now that we have described the severity of the crime scene and the horrible acts performed on Yana by Blake, it is difficult not to reference the commonalities of Blake's book, Syndrome, to the crime he had committed to his own girlfriend. The book is about a chemical imbalance in the mind of a serial killer and a neuropathologist trying to help remove his evil impulses. Blake presented a concept in this book about, quote, draining the blood of his victims. Syndrome is filled with cartoon images of decapitated and bloody women. This book is what prosecutors said he used as a blueprint to kill Yana. This book was published in 2010, which is six years before Yana was murdered. After hearing all about Syndrome, and it even being a piece of evidence in the case, we really wanted to read it ourselves and try to give you that, you know, our own point of view on it. But I'm sorry, there was no part of me that wanted to purchase this, which is the only way I found that you could read this. So we were not able to read it. However, I do want to mention a few things that I did find in the affidavit. It does state that the photographer, whose name is Michael, staged the photo, but not Blake. However, Blake did decide to go with that photo rather than the other 12 that they had. The story was all Blake's. It was all his idea, including the piece about blood draining from the victim's bodies. And one thing I found interesting was when Blake introduced Amanda, his then wife, to Ryan, which is one of the editors, Blake called Amanda, quote, the real Karen, referring to Karen Oates, a victim in syndrome. Blake and his attorneys did try to appeal this evidence, calling it irrelevant and hearsay, but it was still used in the trial. So scary. It really I, if- is. I couldn't imagine being Amanda and hearing that she was like referenced as, you know, being one of the victims in this book. Was she standing right there when he said that? Or was it until she walked away? Like, I'm I'm curious as to when when he would introduce her like that. Like, I feel like she would have as, you know, his partner, I would be reading what my husband was to create. So Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, did she hear that? Did she know? Or was it until the trial that that came out? I have no idea. And it's like, like you said, like, I would, I definitely want to read this book. I just want to know. Um, But no, I'm not paying for his book. I'm Mm -mm. sorry. I can't do it. I can't push myself to do it. You know, we kind of briefly discussed this before we started recording earlier. I want to know if in Blake's mind, he, you know, got to a point where he wanted to perform these acts on somebody and so rather than hurting amanda he found someone else to hurt i mean he was with yana for a year before it happened and obviously was invested in this relationship with her i don't know maybe it could have been because she was pregnant that he didn't do it sooner you know um but he was only with her for a year she got pregnant relatively quick she had the baby and then he does it immediately after it's like he left amanda to start this you know to to fulfill this urge this these evil impulses as he says in his book that he has <laughs> and you know he had to wait until she had the baby i i don't know but um i i can't even imagine how amanda feels i'm sure if this is like true there's a sense of guilt i I would feel some slight guilt 
in the situation. As in, like, I'm the character in this book. Did he want to do these things to me and cared for me so much that he didn't want to, but he needed to fulfill these evil impulses that he found another girl to do this to? You know? Like it should like, have been I, me? Yeah. Like, am okay. I the influence? Am I the person that influenced him to do these things? Because think about it. Like, we got together in 2006. Him and Amanda did. He wrote this book. And it was published in 2010. Like these thoughts, if she was really to be the person that was, what's the word I'm looking for? If she was really Quote, meant to be the, the person, real yeah, Karen, the real Karen Oates, then as messed up as it is, like he possibly didn't want to hurt Amanda. She already had his son. Like she was pregnant with his baby that he was like getting to this point where you know, I, he needs to do this. Like he had to do it. And he found Yana and she was the victim. One thing we really found interesting was the doctor in his book Syndrome was originally called Wolf Brunswick. But not long before it was sent to press, Blake made the decision to change the last name to Chittle, which is actually Blake's mother's maiden name, which made this would feel like a lot more personal it's like he was just the whole plot of his own life you know in right. a way was he you know the person of evil and the doctor like was he trying to carry both titles i can't help but wonder i i, I mean we'll never know right it's just if you see even just the cover of this book now, I know, like you said, uh, I had no idea that there were 12 other photos that they could choose from um, for the cover of Syndrome. And the fact that uh, I'll just describe it. So on the cover of this book, it says across the top Syndrome it has a light blue background with a baby doll on here. And the baby doll is uh, basically half of his head is missing and it reveals the baby's brain so it just looks like its scalp is missing and so because of just the cover alone not just what's inside the book what's written in the book the the pictures and the draining of the victims and things like that but like just the cover of the book itself i mean you can't help but think that prosecutors were right this was a blueprint to how he killed yana it can't just be coincidental in my opinion, everything seems way too in place as to what he wrote and the stories that he told for it to be a coincidence. Exactly. And they kept it in trial, which means that it had some sort of weight to the, the crime. So they must have felt it was important to keep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, speaking of the trial... Um, they didn't do his trial, I think, for like another two years after she was murdered. Um, he was convicted of first degree murder, aggravated mayhem and torture. Now, there's no question that Blake is in jail for the rest of his life, uh, as he should be. His trial was in June of 2018, just two years after he murdered Yana. His father never attended his trial, uh, although his brother Cody did. Cody was there. Amanda was there. Olga, on the other hand, also appeared. And she was there for all six days of this trial. And the trial included photos of her daughter's body in the crime scene. And I can't even imagine how her mom felt at this point. Because um, from my understanding, she was sobbing and she couldn't even look at the screen when pictures were up. And understandably, Olga Cassian filed a civil lawsuit against Blake and she was awarded $41.6 million. Well, this has definitely easily been one of the hardest cases that I myself have ever read about and looked into. One of the most gruesome and yet personal uh, crimes. I mean, he was convicted again, of first-degree murder, aggravated mayhem, and torture. So, and there's no question that Yana suffered for hours before she died. Knowing that he is spending his life in jail, I'm glad that there is justice at the end of this, but the fact that Yana never sees her daughter again, that Olga never sees her daughter again, it's truly heartbreaking. Yeah, it's very sad. And again, 
Um, if you ever hear that, you know, your neighbors are yelling or if there's something that you're just suspicious about or if someone needs help, just try to find the good in helping because, you know, in this particular situation, this one hit really hard for me uh, reading just the time, the timing of everything. You know, the cops were at the door knocking at the door just while she was possibly being hurt. She could have been saved that day. You know, we never know. I know that we do find comfort knowing that Diana is being loved by uh, Yana's family in Ukraine, though. Far away from Blake, as far as possible. And $41.6 million is nothing. That doesn't mean anything. This poor baby is not going to have her mother. And to even just imagine the conversation of uh, what happened to my parents and Olga having to explain that. That's just heartbreaking in itself. We do have to thank you all for going over this with us today and sticking with us through this first episode. And again, welcome to Pretty Little Alibis. We look forward to giving you our next episode Friday after next. Can't wait to see you guys on the next one.